were you radicalized? Are you radicalized? Are, are you an Islamic extremist? Mm -hmm. Well, radicalized, I'd say yes. Me being radicalized isn't something bad. I, I think Nelson Mandela was radicalized. I think some of the sex subjects were radicalized. I think people, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were all radicalized and people called them radicals and such. Was I an Islamic extremist? No. I, I, I don't believe in, in extreme measures. I don't believe in targeting innocent civilians. I don't believe in murdering innocent people for political aims. I don't believe in Islamic elites, right? And I don't believe it's politically right either. And it makes no sense to your cause either. So no, I wasn't an Islamic extremist, but I, I will say that I would radicalize and I think I still am. How do, how do you define being radicalized? As I said, I think some of the most prolific characters and individuals of recent times were regarded in the radicals. So Muhammad Ali, well, how did people see this one as a radical? Malcolm X, definitely seen as a radical. Martin Luther King even was seen as a radical by some people. Nelson Mandela, definitely seen as a radical in prison 27 years for being one. Meaning that the suffragettes here in the UK who fought for the rights for women to get votes, definitely seen as radicals. So I, I certainly believe in radical opposition. You know, wh when you speak out against evil, and if that evil is common, then it's seen as a radical revolutionary act. So I see myself as that, but I, I define I, I very distinctly make a, a, a draw a line between that and what people will call extremism. Because as I said, Malcolm X said, being extreme in the defense of justice is no vice. And being moderate in fighting injustice is a sin. So it really depends on your perspective. Do you support ISIS or the Taliban? I know several people who joined ISIS. And I was in Syria in 2012. ISIS came about, I think, in 2014. So there's people there that I knew who went on to join ISIS. When I was in Syria, one of the reasons I was there was I was investigating the role of the US and the British governments in sending people to the governments of uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. And what I wanted to do was to see to what extent these guys had been tortured with complicity of the British and the Americans. In, my pro in the process of being there, I, I met many people and many of them were involved now in the revolution and fighting and so forth. And I tried to warn them. From what I knew about some of these groups that later became ISIS, but ISIS didn't exist at the time, is that it's you start to kind of present yourself in a way that you're better than the people, or you understand Islam better than the people. It's just a question of time when you turn against them. And that's exactly what happened. So I tried to warn a lot of people. In fact, there were some people who were detained there and tortured by people who went on to become leaders of ISIS that I helped to rescue. And that's one of the reasons why I left him. So do I support ISIS? I think if you just do a basic Google search on what Mazen Beg says about ISIS, you'll see that I, I detest them. And I detest them not because of what the West says. I frankly don't give a damn what the West thinks. I detest ISIS because they executed some of my own friends, literally took them into custody. And when they refused to join ISIS, they executed them. I'm talking about people I lived with, people whose kids I used to help raise. So I have a particular view. Somebody asks me, do I like ISIS? It's like asking me, do I like Guantanamo? If somebody says, do you support ISIS? That question is like, do you support Guantanamo? It's as, it's as heavy as that. The answer is, if you know the answer to one, but not the answer to the other. As for the Taliban, it's a different thing altogether. Totally different. Taliban is not the same as ISIS in any way. And in fact, if there's any group that's fighting, uh, the Taliban right now in Afghanistan, it is ISIS. ISIS carried out the bombing that killed about 16 American troops uh, last week when they were evacuated and about 150 Afghans. The Taliban was protecting those. The Taliban was protecting both the American troops and the Afghans. So the Afghans, the, the Taliban, they were, some of them were in Guantanamo with me. And some of them negotiated with Donald Trump, with uh, Mike Pompeo, the withdrawal of U.S. troops. And so they were part of the negotiating team that helped that withdrawal. Now, I don't agree with everything the Taliban does, especially in relation to female education and so forth. 
But yeah, it's important we make a distinction between the two. Taliban, the Americans negotiated, meaning they could negotiate with them. ISIS, you can't. ISIS was born out of, I mean, they were brought out of the, born out of the dungeons of Abu Ghraib and uh, Camp Bukha, which is another story. <laughs> but ISIS has caused more damage to the Muslim world, I think, than any any in recent history. What do you understand about the psychology of ISIS? Why, why is it that these people exist and what are they trying to accomplish? So if you look at the history of ISIS, it's really interesting, right? Because, it, and there is a connection to the invasion of, America, of, of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So when America, just think about this, there was no Al-Qaeda, let alone ISIS. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq until the invasion. Why did the invasion happen? America said that, that uh, uh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. They didn't. But when America went into Iraq, that's when ISIS set up as an organization, Islamic State of Iraq. But where did they set up? You control, you destroyed the Iraqi government. So members of the Iraqi government who were in prison, along with members of Al Qaeda, who only came after and because of the invasion, right? So Abu Musab al Zarqawi and his organization, they come into Iraq as part of Al Qaeda as a result of the invasion. Their prisoners, Al Qaeda prisoners, meet with Saddam Hussein's former leaders, and they meet where Abu Ghraib and Camp Bukha. That's where they formulate ISIS and its ideology. The ideology of savagery and butchery, along with, let's do this in the name of Sunni Islam. And that's what happens. They break out from there, they call themselves Islamic State of Iraq, and then when the revolution happens in Syria, they move into Syria, they stab all the Syrian organizations and revolutions in the back, Instead of making the focus the Assad regime, they make the focus resistance. And America can't tell the difference between ISIS and the resistance, and they start to oppose everything. And so that revolution fails entirely, and ISIS now becomes the main thing. So, you know, if you look at the history of it, you, you'll see that there's this organization, forget the West, it's born out of the blood of Muslims. It's killing Muslims everywhere. And then it starts to target the West. And they know that the West is going to kind of respond back and bomb Syria. And that's exactly what happened. So it's hard for people to be able to tell the difference between ISIS and the other groups to say if they're armed, if they're fighting, they're all ISIS. Uh, and that's pretty much how, how it's how it ended up. Why does ISIS hate Muslims so much? ISIS believes in its vision of establishing what it calls an Islamic state. That's what it says. And if you don't agree with ISIS, because they say that the establishing of the Islamic state is the most important thing, and that's what's going to protect the Muslims all over the world. And if you oppose them, it's like Bush's war on terror. If you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. They're either with us or against us. There's no, you know, this war has no Switzerland. <laughs> this war has no middle ground with us or against us. And that's how ISIS works. And that's what I said. They, they executed friends of mine who refused to join up. And said, no, I'm not, not going to join you. I'm, I don't believe what you're doing is right. You're killing other Muslims. You're, you're changing the focus. We're fighting a dictator and you're making the world fight us and hate us. So there's so many things they were doing. Well, it, the, the list is endless. As I said, I know the Syrian situation quite well. And that's why you know, it, it, it saddens me when I hear somebody say, what, do you, you, do you condemn ISIS? It's like asking me, do I condemn Guantanamo? Yes, of course I do. That's why I warned you it was going to be an ignorant question. <laughs> Are you angry at America? Do you, do you seek revenge against America? No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm a very, very strong believer in the statement of Omar al-Muhtar, who said when he was fighting the uh, Italian occupation of the fascists in his country, when some of his um, soldiers caught American soldiers, uh, um, Italian soldiers, they torture us, they kill us, they murder us. Omar al-Muhtar's response was, they are not our teachers. And so America, what I've seen of it, the torture, the abuse, the detention of that trial, the murder, the mass killing, it's America. Unfortunately, that's an American thing. The invasions of so many countries, the use of nuclear weapons and atomic weapons. That's an American thing. Uh, America's not my teacher. Therefore, I don't seek vengeance American style. I see justice Islam style. 
And that justice is that those who are responsible for the torture and the abuse should be held to account. And if they're not in this life, then they will in the next life. And whatever justice we as human beings can meet out will be nothing compared to the justice that our Creator has. But still, nonetheless, I still have a duty to tell people. I've been involved in giving evidence at the International Criminal Court. I've given evidence at war crimes tribunals. I've given evidence to the British police. I've given evidence to um, government-led inquiries uh, about torture. So it isn't that just I only talk about the court of the hereafter. I try very much here. So, but I don't want to see. I don't want to see Americans go to jail for crimes they haven't committed. I don't want to see innocent Americans targeted or killed or tortured or abused. I don't want them to have to face what I faced. But there does need to be a reckoning. There needs to be some kind of a truth and reconciliation, the same as there was, was in South Africa. But, and I think if I compare America to, say, China, for example, I think you know, what China does to the Uyghurs is on an industri industrial scale. We had 22 Uyghurs with us in Guantanamo. And all of them say, we thank God that we were sent to Guantanamo, not to, 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 to China, where they forcibly ask you to renounce or make you renounce your faith. So in a sense, <clears throat> well, I know America is not like that uh, in comparison, but it's just unfortunate that to be the recipient of abuse, you should even have to reduce yourself to having to make comparison. If the American government, its military involved in criminality, then it should be held to its own standards. And if it can't, then its standards fall in the rest of the world. So America did me a favor, to be honest with you. They did me a favor. The favor they did me is, is what happened in my dream. Had it not been for America and what it did, my voice wouldn't have echoed around the world and you wouldn't be wanting to be me either. And it's beautiful that you, the dream came true about your child as well. Every part of the dream, I, at least personally, I could see how it came to fruition. Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. And that was probably not the most stark part of it because that, if there's anything that really hurt me, I was there for the birth of all of my children except my, my youngest. But that was foretold to me in a dream the way, in a way that I couldn't have understood before, but I understood it afterwards. I'm your host, Mahmoud Al-Ansari, and this is the Ansari Podcast. <laughs>